Hello students and welcome to today's lecture. Today we will be talking about D.H. Lawrence's Sons and Lovers and we will be focusing our discussion uh, to Gertrude Morrell's relationships with her sons, William Morrell as well as Paul Morrell. So we will be starting with Mrs. Morrell's uh, opinion about Miss Western, the lover of uh, her son, William Morrell. So here in page number 154, uh, you see there is a conversation uh, in the family about Miss Western. So it starts with uh, Paul Morrell saying, he spends over 50 shillings a week on himself, said Paul. And I keep this house on less than 30, she replied. She asking Gertrude, and I am supposed to find money for extras, but they don't care about helping you once they've gone. He'd rather spend it on that dressed up creature. She should have her own money if she's so grand, said Paul. She should, but she hadn't, hasn't, I asked him. I know he doesn't buy her a gold bangle for nothing. I wonder whoever bought me a gold bangle. William was succeeding with his gypsy, as he called her. He asked the girl, her name was Lucia Lily Dennis Weston, for a photograph to send to his mother. The photo came, a handsome brunette, sent to his mother. The photo came, a handsome brunette, taken in profile, smirking slightly, and it might be quite naked. For on the photograph, not a scrap of clothing was to be seen, only a naked bust. Yes, wrote Mrs. Morrell to her son. The photograph of Louis is very striking. I can see she must be attractive. But do you think, my boy, it is very good taste of a girl to give her young man that photo to send to her mother, the first? Certainly, the shoulders are beautiful, as you say. But I hardly expected to see so much of them at the first view. We will be skipping a few. Dear mother, William replied, I am sorry you didn't like the photograph. It never occurred to me when I sent it that you mightn't think it decent. However, I told Jip that it didn't quite suit your prim and proper notions. So she's going to send you another and I hope will please you better. She's always been photographed. In fact, the photographers ask her if they may take her for nothing. Presently, the new photograph came with a little silly note from the girl. This time, the young lady was seen in a black satin evening bodice, cut square with little puff sleeves and lace, black lace hanging down her beautiful arms. I wonder if she ever wears anything except evening clothes, said Mrs. Morrell sarcastically. I'm sure I ought to be impressed. You are disagreeable, mother, said Paul. I think the first one with bare shoulders is lovely. Do you, answered his mother. Well, I don't. We will skip a bit more. Good morning, mother, he said. This is in page number 157. Good morning, mother, he said, smiling, but feeling very unhappy. Good morning, she replied cheerfully and tenderly. She stood in her white apron on the open road, watching him as he crossed the field. He had a small compact body that looked full of life. She felt as she saw him trudging over the field that where he determined to go, he would get. She thought of William. He would have leaped the fence instead of going around the stile. He was away in London doing well. Paul would be working in Nottingham. Now she had two sons in the world. She could think of two places, great centers of industry, and feel that she had put a man into each of them, that these men would work out what she wanted. They were derived from her, they were of her, and their works would also be hers. All the morning long, she thought of Paul. So what is interesting here is that instead of merely perceiving Gertrude's deep and intense possessiveness over her sons as a negative character trait, we can look at her in another way as well. And despite her jealousy, uh, her seemingly apparent jealousy, uh, 
and her negative sentiments towards Miss Western, we can still try to understand Gertrude, right? Because we understand that Gertrude is a victim of the patriarchal world. She never had much exposure to men considering the conventional way she was reared and nurtured as a child. And then she, as you know, married below her station to Walter Morell and ended up in a marriage where she felt very entrapped, oppressed and restricted, unable to realize her dreams, right? Then she struggles to realize them through her male children who would have more mobility, more agency and more assertiveness and freedom in the social world than women, right? Because women become victims of the patriarchal system once they are in the marital relationship, their agency is restricted, their mobility is restricted. However, the problem is in doing so, she develops an unhealthy possessiveness over her own children, over William and Paul, viewing them as an extension of herself. And this becomes very evident in this last paragraph that we read, right? Where she says that uh, now she had two sons in the world, she would think of two places, and that these men would work out that she won't work out what she wanted. They would deride from her. So that is where you see her intense possessiveness and the way in which she regards her children as an extension of herself, right? So in doing so, the problem is like she de she builds like uh, a possessiveness over them, and they are also unable to break away from this bond that they have with their mother, right? And this is manifesting through her dissatisfaction, uh, her jealousy and deep possessiveness over her sons. You see that it is manifesting. Uh, over her son's lovers, right? So in William's case, it is with Miss Western, and in Paul's case, it is predominantly with uh, Miriam and to a certain extent with Clara, right? So you see that as a result, she comes across as very overbearing, uh, overbearing in her attempts to control the future choices and future goals of her two sons, right? And we will also be talking about uh, the deep repercussions of her decisions, uh, of her overbearing and possessive bond with her sons and what happens as a result. So we will be looking at this later. From there, with this line of thought in mind, I want to go to another page, and that is in page number 392. I believe we can start reading from, but then, but she began to spare her hands. Yeah, it starts with page number 391, uh, the last paragraph here. But she began to spare her hands. They too were not well groundled now. The skin was shiny. So with so much hot water, the knuckles rather swollen. But she began to be careful to keep them out of soda. She regretted what they had to be, so small and exquisite. And when Annie insisted on her having more stylish blouses to suit her age, she submitted. She even bent so far as to allow a black velvet bow to be placed on her hair. Then she sniffed in her sarcastic manner and was sure she looked a sight. But she looked a lady. Paul declared, as much as Mrs. Major Moreton, and far, far nicer. The family was coming on, only Morel remained unchanged, or rather lapsed slowly. 
Paul and his mother now had long discussions about life. Religion was fading into the background. He had shoveled away all the beliefs that would hamper him, had cleared the ground and come more or less to the bedrock of belief that one should feel inside oneself for right and wrong and should have the patience to gradually realize one's good. Now life interested him more. You know, he said to his mother, I don't want to belong to the well-to-do middle class. I like my common people best. I belong to the common people. But if anyone else said so, my son, wouldn't you be in a tear? You know you, you consider yourself equal to any gentleman. In myself, he answered, not in my class or my education or my manners, but in myself I am. Very well then. Then why talk about the common people? Because the difference between people isn't in their class, but in themselves. Only from the middle classes one gets ideas, and from the common people, life itself, warmth. You feel their hates and loves. It's all very well, my boy. But then, why don't you go and talk to your father's pals? But they're rather different. Not at all. They are the common people. After all, whom do you mix with now? Among the common people, those that exchange ideas like the middle class, the rest don't interest you. Next page. But there's the life. I don't believe there's a jot more life from Miriam than you would get from any educated girl. Say, Miss Morton, it is you who are snobbish about class. She frankly wanted him to climb into the middle classes, a thing not very difficult, she knew. And she wanted him to, him in the end, to marry a lady. Now she began to combat him in his restless fretting. He still kept up his connection with Miriam, could neither break free nor go to the whole length of engagement. And this indec indecision seemed to bleed him of his energy. Moreover, his mother suspected him of an unrecognized leaning towards Clara, and since the latter was a married woman, she wished he would fall in love with one of the girls in a better station of life. But he was stupid and would refuse love or even to admire a girl much, just because she was his social superior. So here you see that uh, Gertrude Morrell's need for upward mobility through her sons right, in terms of her aspirations that she has towards her sons, because you see that her aspirations for upward mobility is through Paul, right, is through Paul by securing him a marital union, which would elevate his class. However, you know that in the novel, these dreams and aspirations that she has towards elevating Paul's class through uh, a marital match does not come to Fruitation, right? So again, they end up as shattered expectations and unrealistic dreams that Gertrude Morrell has, just like she, what she has towards the beginning of her marriage, where she was ennobling Walter and his profession and in the top dissolution, right? So you see that because she bears a very strong, her, her as in Gertrude Morrell, she bears a very strong sense of class consciousness. So as a result, uh, she has all these aspirations and a quest for upward mobility, which she wishes to fulfill through her sons, first through William and then through Paul, right? So all of these lead her to develop this overtly possessive bond with them and her to remain in this constant state of dissatisfaction and disillusionment because of her unrealistic fantasies right, because of her uh, expectations, which remain to be never fulfilled and remain to be, uh, remain to be completely ungratified, right? So from there, uh, let's go to another page. So this is in page number 598.
So this section um, starts with Yes, this is on about the death of uh, Gertrude Morel. So that episode, I think we can start with reading the conversation that uh, Paul and uh, Paul and Gertrude has, like towards her death. So it starts with Paul. She murmured. Paul uh, in page number five hundred ninety-six in this book. Paul, she murmured, her heart seemed to break again. He went in and sat by the bed. How late you are, she murmured. Not very, he said. Why? What time it is, is it? The murmur came plaintive uh, and helpless. It's only just gone 11. That was not true. It was nearly one o'clock. Oh, she said, I thought it was later. And he knew the unutterably misery of the nights and nights that would not go. Can't you sleep, my pigeon? He said. No, I can't. She wailed. Never mind, little. He was crony. Never mind, my love. I'll stop with you half an hour, my pigeon. Then perhaps it will be better. And he sat by the bedside slowly, rhythmically, stroking her brows with his fingertips, stroking her eyes shut, soothing her, holding her fingers in his free hand. They could hear the sleepers breathing in the others in the other rooms. Now go to bed, she murmured, lying quite still under his fingers and his love. Will you sleep, he asked. Yes, I think so. You feel better, my little, don't you? Yes, she said, like a fretful, hostile child. Still, the days and weeks flew by. He hardly went to see Clara now. Skipping a few. Uh, in page number 598. Then she gave, uh, then Paul would go upstairs gingerly, guiltily, to see to see if she had heard. Shall I give you some milk, he asked. A little, she replied plaintively. And he would put some water with it so that it should, nourish, it should not nourish her. Yet he loved her more than his own life. She had morphia every night and her heart grew fitful. And Annie, Annie slept beside her. Paul would go in the early morning when his sister got up. His mother was wasted and almost ashen in the morning with morphia. Darker and darker grew her eyes, all pupil with the torture. In the mornings, the weariness and age were, were too much to bear, yet she, she could not, would not sleep, or even complain much. You slept a bit later this morning, little one, he would say to her. Did I? She answered with fretful weariness. Yes, it's nearly eight o'clock. Okay, so you can read the rest by yourself, but you know that in this uh, in this chapter, Paul doses his administers his mother a fatal dose of morphine in order to hasten her death, right? In order to give her a peaceful death. So this fatal doses of morphine, it's like not one dose, it's like. Uh, a couple of doses, right? So these fatal doses of morphine, which are administered to Gertrude's system by her, her own son, Paul, to relieve her pain, continue to slowly sap away Gertrude's strength until she dies, right? So what we can do is we can try to symbolically interpret this because this can symbolically represent the victimization of Gertrude Morrell. She, uh, because it depicts the negative aspects of this patriarchal culture, which restricts the woman's mobility and agency. Gertrude's inability to secure happiness with what morale leads her to completely direct her attention towards fulfilling her dreams via Paul. And as we talked about uh, these earlier, these dreams and aspirations that she has towards Paul uh, continue to remain. Uh, unsatisfied, they are never fulfilled, they never come to fruition, right? So 
by the end of the book, you see these fatal doses of morphine administered, administered to her by her son, Paul, as her strength slowly saps away and she dies, right? She becomes this utter victim of the patriarchal system. So from there, I want to go to another page, another extract. So that is in page number 363. Okay, so in your book, that is actually in page number 637 because these are actually the final few pages of the book. Okay, it starts with this conversation between Paul and Miriam. Paul says uh, in page number th uh, six, 637, will you have me to marry me? He said very low. Or why did, not, uh, why did not he take her? Her very soul belonged to him. Why would he not take what was his? She had borne so long the cruelty of belonging to him and not being claimed by him. Now he was training her again. It was too much for her. She drew back her head, held his face between her hands and looked him in the eyes. No, he was hard. He wanted something else. She pleaded to him with all her love not to make her choice. She could not cope with it. With him, she knew not with, that, with what, but it strained her, her till she felt she would break. Do you want it? She asked very gravely. Not much. He replied with pain. She turned to face aside, then raising herself with dignity, she took his head to her bosom and rocked him softly. She was not to have him then. She could comfort him. She put her fingers through his hair. For her, the anguished sweetness of self-sacrifice, for him, the hate and misery of another failure. He could not bear it, that breast which was warm and which cradled him without taking the burden of him. So much he wanted to rest on her that the faint of rest only tortured him. He drew away. And without marriage, we can do nothing, he asked. His mouth was lifted from his teeth with pain. She put her little finger between her lips, between her lips. No, she said, low and like a toll of a bell. No, I think not. It was the end then between them. She could not take him and relieve him of the responsibility of himself. She could only sacrifice herself to him, sacrifice herself every day gladly, and that he did not want. He wanted her to hold him and say with joy and authority, Stop this restlessness and beating against the death. You're mine for a mate. She had not the strength. Or was, she, was it a mate she wanted? Or did she want a Christ in him? So we will be skipping a few from there. And then go to the section where he says, he felt in leaving her, he was de defrauding her of life. He felt in leaving her, he was defrauding her of life. But he knew that in staying, still in the inner desperate man, he was denying his own life. And he did not he did not hope to give life to her by defending his own. So we will skip some more and go to the section, the final two paragraphs in this book. It says, he shook hands and left her at the door of her cousin's house. When he turned away, he felt the last hold for him had worn. The town, as he sat upon the chair, stretched away over the, over the bay of railway. A level fume of lights. Beyond the town, the country, little smoldering spots for more towns. The sea, the night, on and on. And he had no place in it. Whatever spot he stood on, there he stood alone. From his breast, from his mouth, sprang the endless space. And it was there behind him, everywhere. The people hurrying along the streets offered no obstruction to the void in which he found himself. 
they were small shadows whose footsteps and voices could be heard. But in each of them, the same night, the same silence. He got out of the car. Okay, skipping up. We had to read some more uh, because there's an important section here. In the country, all was dead still. Little stars shone up. Little stars spread away to the flood waters, a firmament below. Everywhere were the vastness and terror of immense night, which is roused and stirred by brief by the day, but which returns will remain at last eternal, holding everything in its silence and living gloom. There was no time, only space. Who, who could say his mother had lived and did not live? She had been in one place and was an was in another that was all and his soul could not leave her wherever she was now she had gone abroad into the night and he was and he was with her still they were together but yet there was his body his chest that leaned against the tile his hands on a wooden bar they seemed something where was he one tiny uptight upright speck of flesh less than on ear of feet lost in the field he could not bear it on every side the immense dark, dark silence seemed pressing him so a tiny spark into extinction yet almost nothing he could not be extinct night in which everything was lost went reaching out beyond the suns and stars stars and suns a few bright grains went spinning round for terror and holding each other in embrace they are a darkness out past them all and left them tiny and daunted so much and himself infinitesimal at that core of nothingness and yet nothing mother he whispered mother she was the only thing that held him himself amid all this and she was gone intermingled herself he wanted to touch him and to have have him alongside with her but he no he would not give in turning sharply he walked towards the city's uh, skipping a few um he walked towards the faintly humming blowing town quickly okay so the reason why i highlighted this section is because they are very important because um paul if you take our buildings from a protagonist has all these unsuccessful relationships with women his entire life right so in the first section that we read from here we see him ending his relationship with miriam right so afterwards uh so before this you know that uh, he finally consummates his relationship with clara right but when he does so he is disappointed and dissatisfied to find out that it is merely physical but Miriam, on the other hand, appeals to his spiritual and idealistic side. But she needs to marry Paul in order to have a sexual relationship with him, right? So that is the reason why uh, he says that without marriage, we can do nothing. And she replies by saying, no, no, I think not, not, right? So as a result, you see that all these trials and experiences that he has from these women in his life lead to his development his maturation and psychological development and this ultimate realization that he does not want to be limited restrained and stifled like in the kind of relationship he had with his mother before her death right so towards the end of the novel we see that Paul comes to the self-realization that he is seeking his own freedom and liberty or emancipation. Uh, so in order to do this, he realizes that he comes to the realization that he must not sacrifice his genuine needs and desires just for the purpose of satisfying others' desires. So here he comes to the realization that he should not satisfy uh, satisfy Miriam's desires at the cost of losing his own uh, self, at the cost of losing uh, the realization of his genuine needs and desires, right? Because he's aware that uh, if he gets into a relationship with Miriam, he would be uh, stifling her, just like the kind of relationship that he had with her mother. 
And when we come to these sections where we highlighted about the darkness that Paul feels, some critics say that Paul seems to be lost and despondent in the final few paragraphs in the novel, where he's talking about the core of nothingness, yet was nothing, the silence, the devastating silence and living in gloom in all these sections. So critics seem to say that uh, Paul seemed lost and despondent, right? But you see that that does not um, remain the same, right? Because towards the end of the paragraph, it says that he, he cannot give into that darkness. He will not give into that darkness, that he is going to walk towards the city, right? And that he's going to progress onwards. That is the kind of ending that we have in this narrative, right? So towards the ending, with, but no, he would not give in. You see that uh, there is a very solid affirmation of Paul's goal to strive towards his own self-actualization, which is the ideal or uh, ideal or perfect narrative affirmation of the complete maturation or development of the Bildungsroman hero, right? Because I said that in a Bildungsroman, uh, the maturation process, the self-actualization uh, of the Bildung's Roman is what you have towards the ending. And here you have Paul's, uh, Paul's uh, self-actualization, where he realizes that he has to break away from all these relationships uh, and that he should not give himself away at the cost of fulfilling the desires, at the cost of fulfilling the satisfactions of the lovers of his life and completely breaks away from them and breaks away from this devastating darkness which threatens to consume him after his mother's death and then continues to uh, progress onwards, to go towards the light, to go towards the future, right? So that is his self-actualization in this narrative. So from there, I want to go to another important extract. So that is in uh, page number 168. Okay, so it's in 168 uh, in my book, but the, in this book that I'm sharing with you, it is in page number 296. So here we will, in page number 296, we will be talking about uh, the religion right, because I said there are some important aspects in terms of uh, the Bildung's Roman uh, hero, and one of the things that we identified, the predominant preoccupations that we identified, is this, uh, uh, is this uh, is religion, and how the novel, uh, or the novel's protagonist, uh, deals with religion, right, so to look at this, let's go to page number 296, Okay, um, so it starts with, at this time, he was beginning to question. Yeah, this is the middle paragraph of page number 296. At this time, he was beginning to question the Orthodox creed. He was 21 and she was 20. So she is uh, a reference to Miriam here. She was beginning to dread the spring. He became so wild and hurt her so much all the way, he went cruelly smashing her beliefs. Edgar enjoyed it. He was by nature critical and rather dispassionate. But Miriam suffered exquisite pain, as with an intellect like a knife. The man she loved examined her religion, in which she lived and moved and had her being. But he did not spare her. He was cruel. And then went, and then they went alone. He was even more fierce as if he would kill her soul. He bled her beliefs till she almost lost consciousness. She exults. She exults as she carries him from off from me. Mrs. Morrell cried in her heart when Paul had gone. She is not like an ordinary woman who can leave me my share of in him. She wants to absorb him. She wants to draw him out and absorb him till there is nothing left of him, even for himself. He will never be a man on his own feet. She will suck him up. So the mother sat, battled and brooded bitterly. 
and he, coming home from his walks with Miriam and wild with torture, was wild with torture. He walked biting his lips and clenched fists, going at a great rate, then brought up against a stile. He stood for some minutes and did not move. But there was a great hollow of darkness fronting him, and on the black upsoles, patches of tiny light, and in the lowest through the night, a flare of the pit. It was all weird and dreadful. Why was he torn so, almost bewildered and unable to move? Why did his mother sit at home and suffer? He knew that she suffered badly, but why should she? And why did she hate Miriam and feel so cruelly towards her? And at the thoughts of his mother, if Miriam caused his mother suffering, then he hated her and he easily hated her. Why did she make you feel as if he was uncertain of himself, insecure and indefinite thing, as if he had not sufficient shaping to prevent the night and the space breaking into him? How he hated her. And then what a rush of tenderness and humility. Suddenly, he plunged on a again running home his mother saw on him the marks of some agony and she said nothing but he had to make her talk to him then she was angry with him for going on going so far with miriam why don't you like her mother he cried in despair i don't know my boy she replied piteously i'm sure i've tried to like her i've tried and tried but i can't i can't he felt dreary and hopeless between the two so you see that throughout the book, Lawrence makes a few references to Paul Morel's change in relationship with the traditional religious life and practice. And here I want to direct you to my presentation. So this critique called Richard D. Beards says that Paul's fall from orthodoxy coincides with the growth of his mystic awareness. And at another point in the novel, it says that he was, he as in Paul, Paul was setting now full sail towards agnosticism. So agnosticism is basically uh, including those who believe it's impossible to know that God exists, right? So in that reference, you see that it is referring to Paul's beliefs in religious agnosticism, as both Paul and Lawrence himself speak of God only, metaphorically, right? So it comes to a stage in life where Paul, uh, for Paul, God has nothing to do with institutional faith. But Paul, ha Paul only believes in God in a very mystical sense, right? So that is where you see his development in terms of his religious belief, where Paul does not believe in institutional faith anymore, but he only believes in religion uh, in a mystical kind of sense, in a mystical sense, right? And, and even at one point in the novel, uh, he comments how even a crow can be religious because it feels itself carried away, carried away to where it's going, just like Paul himself, who wishes to be unshackled and free from the institutions and the women in his life who stifle him. And in the previous section where we read about Gertrude's dissatisfaction with Miriam and uh, Paul's torn and conflicted feelings about his mother, whom he loves deeply, uh, dissatisfaction with Miriam and how she's uh, deeply unhappy with their relationship because she believes that uh, Miriam is going to absorb Paul. He feels, you see that he feels very deeply conflicted. He feels very stifled uh, in this, in this, uh, in, in these complicated, in, entangled and entrapped in these complicated relationships, right? So these are sections where you should highlight in the book because you see to what extent Paul feels conflicted in terms of uh, his uh, very deep uh, relationship with his mother and then his intense feelings with uh, towards Miriam to which his mother is very deeply unhappy about 
and how this conflict continues on to develop and develop until his mother's death, until there is nothing uh, holding him back, right? So afterwards, immediately afterwards, he continues to break away his relationship with Miriam and progresses on onwards without giving into the darkness, which continues to threaten, which threaten to overwhelm him, right? So this is where um, you can also notice his development in terms of religion, as I said earlier, uh, how he's selling full sail towards agnosticism, where he believes in God in a mystical sense, rather than believe in the believing in the church as an institution, right? And this also deeply hurts Miriam too, because uh, in doing so, in having all his beliefs, he's trying to impose them on Miriam, who is deeply religious and continues to be hurt as a result, right? Okay, so from there, I want to go to another important extract, and that is in page number 52. In my book, it is actually in page number 52, but in the book I'm sharing with you, it's in page 91. Okay, the chapter is The Young Life of Paul. Okay, uh, we will start reading from the final paragraph in page number 91 here. All the children, but particularly Paul, were peculiarly, peculiar peculiarly against their father, along with their mother. Morel continued to bully and to dream. He had periods months at a time where he made the whole life of the family a misery. Paul never forgot coming home from the band of hope one Monday evening and finding his mother with her eyes, with her eyes swollen and discolored. His father standing at, on, the heart, on the hearth rug feet astride, his head down, and William just home from work, glaring at his father. There was a silence as the young children entered, but none of the elders looked around. Looked around. William was white to the lips, and his fists cl were clenched. He waited until the children were silent, watching with children's rage and hate. Then he said, you covered, you dare not do it when I was in. But Morel's blood was up. He swung round on his son. William was bigger, but Morel was hard-muscled and mad with furry. Doesn't I? He shouted, doesn't I? Head me much more, O Daicha, my young jockey, and I'll rattle my fist about thee, I, and I shall that, Dowsy. Morel crouched at the knees and showed his fist in an ugly, almost beast-like fashion. William was white with rage. William, he said, quiet and intense. It should be the last time, though. Moral danced, uh, Moral danced a little nearer, crouching, drawing back his fist to strike. William put his fists ready. A light came into his blue eyes, almost like a laugh. He watched his father, another word, and, and the men would have had begun a fight. Paul hoped they would. The three children sat pale on the sofa. Okay. So, uh, as you know, this is a novel where you see a lot of critics are doing a psychoanalytic criticism of, right? So, when we do a psychoanalytic criticism of Sons and Lovers, we can relate Sigmund Freud's Oedipus complex here, right? Uh, Sigmund Freud's Oedipus complex about the child's emerging sexuality. So Freud says that, to put it very simply, all male children form an erotic attachment towards their mother and become jealous of the mother's relationship with the father. And the male children, however, despite this, uh, despite this jealousy that they built up with, still fears being castrated by the father. And then they continue to repress uh, their sexual desires for the mother 
and waits to have his own sexual experience as an adult, right? So Freud says that if a boy does not successfully fulfill these steps, he will actually carry the Oedipus complex with him towards adulthood. So the Oedipus complex in uh, the two sons, Paul and William, is evident even more because they witness this abusive nature of their parents' relationship growing up. And they, this, uh, these have very deep repercussions in terms of their psychological development, right? So as a result, you see that Paul and William learn to hate their father and they become very sympathetic towards their mother. And Gertrude Morrell also is overly protective of her children and shelters them away from him. And even at one point in the novel, Walter accuses Gertrude of pitting the children against him. And this only helps in fueling the children's dislike against the father, right? So from there to continue on this uh, discussion, I would like to go to page number 176. Okay, um, we will read certain sections of this chapter and then we will finally, uh, we will continue to read certain sections and analyze them in this chapter. So here first, uh, let's go to uh, the final paragraph of page number seven, 176 and his father, whom he had loved and who had worshiped him, he came to detest as he grew older, Morel fell into slow ruin. His body, which had been beautiful in movement and in being, shrank, did not seem to ripen with the ears, but to get meaner and rather despicable. There came over him a look of meanness and paltriness. And when the mean, uh, mean looking elderly man bullied or ordered the boy about, Arthur was furious. Moreover, Paul's manners got worse and worse and his habits somewhat disgusting. When the children were growing up and in the crucial stage of adolescence, the father was like some ugly irritant to their souls. His manners in the house were the same as he used among the colliers John Pitt. Dirty nuisance, Arthur would cry, jumping up and going straight out of the house when his father disgusted him. And Morel persisted the more because his children hated it. He seemed to be, he seemed to take a kind of satisfaction in disgusting them and driving them nearly mad while they were so irritably sensitive at the age of 14 and 15. So that Arthur, who was growing up when his father was degenerate and elderly, hated him the worst of it. Worst of it. So here in these sections, in this chapter, you see that the familial dissatisfaction continued to build in this family, right? You see that Walter is physically and externally degenerating. And uh, he even continues to thrive in the hatred of his own son, Arthur, right? Deriving some sort of satisfaction through it. And uh, when we go to the section which says, here, page number 178, he remembered he had brought no engagement ring at all, and she preferred William, who was not mean, if he were foolish. But now the young man only talked of dances, to which he went with a betrothed and the different uh, uh, replenished clothes she wore. Or he told his mother with glee how they went to the theater with great spells. So here you see that William Morrell. Uh, Gertrude's son's William Morrell seems to be obsessed in pursuing temporal and material gratifications, which are only available to him in the city in spite of the degenerating conditions of his family, right? And then continuing on from there, uh, we'll skip a section to the place in the narrative where Miss Weston comes to the house. 
And there is this conversation between Miss Western and William. Yeah, I told you, I told you, you'd no need to change, said William to her. Oh, Chubby. Then she turned with a sweetish smile to Mrs. Morrell. Do you think he's all this grumbling, Mrs. Morrell? Is he, said Mrs. Morrell. That's not very nice of him. It isn't really. You are cold, said the mother. Won't you come near the fire? Morrell jumped out of his armchair. Come and sit you here, he cried. Come and sit you here. No, Dad, keep, keep your own chair. Sit in the sofa, Jip, said William. No, no, cried Morrell. The chair's warmest, the ch this chair's warmest. Come and sit here, Miss Weston. Thank you so much, said the girl, seating herself in the collier's armchair, the place of honor. She shivered, feeling the warmth of the kitchen penetrate her. Fetch me a hanky, chubby dear, she said, putting her up her mouth to him, and using the same intimate tone as if they were alone, which made the rest of the family feel if they ought not to be present. The young lady evidently did not realize them as people. They were creatures to her for the present. William winced. In such household, uh, we will skip a few. I'll go, said Annie. Miss Weston took no notice, as if a servant had spoken. But when the girl came downstairs again with the handkerchief, she said, oh, thank you, in a gracious way. She sat and talked about the dinner on the train, which had been so poor, about London, about dances. She was really very nervous and chattered from fear. Morel all the time sat, sat all the time, smoking his thick twist tobacco, watching her and listening to her glib London speech as he puffed. Mrs. Morel, dressed in her blessed black silk blouse, answered quietly and rather briefly. The three children sat round the silence and admiration, round in silence and admiration. Miss Weston was the princess. Everything of the best was got out for her. The best cups, the best spoons, the best table cup, the best coffee chuck. The children thought she must find it quite grand. She felt strange, not able to realize the people, not knowing how to treat them, feeling jolt, but was slightly uncomfortable. So you see here in these sections, the class consciousness of Miss Western, right? Her sense of superiority becomes very evident here in terms of the manner in which she is treating the family, right? She's treating them as if they are inferior to her, as if uh, they are servants, right? So here you see his, her class consciousness, her elitist manners in terms of how he believes herself to occupy a status higher than the Collier family becomes evident here. And from there, let's go to another page in the same chapter. They are William. Uh, William is having a conversation with his mother about his relationship with Miss Western. Starts with well, mother. Here, in page number one hundred and eighty-three. Well, mother, well, my son. She sat in the rocking chair. She sat in the rocking chair, feeling somehow hurt and humiliated for his sake. Do you like her? Yes, came the slow answer. She's shy yet, mother. She's not used to it. It's different from her aunt's house, you know. Of course it is, my boy. She must find it difficult. She does. Then she frowns swiftly. If only she wouldn't put on her blessed airs. It's only the first awkwardness, my boy. She'll be all right. That's it. That's it, mother, he replied gratefully. But his brow was gloomy. You know, she's not like you, mother. She's not serious. And she can't think. Skipping a few more. So here, Miss Weston says, Chubby dear, that question is not permitted. Is it, Mrs. Morrow? She played the grand lady at first. Then she went with William to chapel, he in his frock coat and silk hat, she in her furs and London made costume. Paul and Arthur and Annie expected everyone to bow to the ground in admiration. And Morrell, 
standing with his son is sword at the end of the road, watching the gallant pair go, felt he was the father of a princess, prince and princess. And yet she was not so grand. For a year now, she had been sort of a secretary or clerk at the London office. But while she was with the morals, she queened it. She sat and let Annie or Paul bait on her, as if they were her servants. She treated Mrs. Morrell with certain glibness and Morrell with patronage. But after one day or so, she began to change her tune. Skipping um, a few more. And Lily went upstairs with a cross shut mouth. But it angered the young man that she made a servant of her sister. So here in these sections, you see William's overly deep attachment towards his mother and how it is negatively manifested in his adulthood, where he's searching the same characteristics or good qualities that he sees in his mother through gypsy, and they continue uh, to have these expectations shattered and be disillusioned just like his mother earlier who was who ended up uh, being disillusioned in terms of these ennobling uh, expectations that she had of her husband so that is very evident when uh, William says with reference to Miss Weston you know she's not like you mother she's not serious and she can't think right so you see that these uh, revelations they continue to frustrate and disillusion William right and at the same time he also does not want to break off of thinking about them right so critics have said that it is only in his uh, it is actually not only William's physical illness but also his edible fixation and conflicted feelings which eventually lead him towards his death Right. So this Oedipal fixation is also the reason why Paul is Paul, uh, her other son, or the protagonist of this narrative, is unable to build any meaningful relationships with the women or the lovers in his life, such as Clara and Miriam. Right. So you see that uh, in Paul's case, unlike Miriam, uh, who is different to Clara, is actually not a threat to Paul's Oedipal fixation with his mother, right? And that is because unlike Clara, Miriam wanted to be, uh, Miriam wanted to completely possess Paul, right? She already had a very deep spiritual bond with Paul that she had developed. And you see that Gertrude, the mother, felt deeply threatened by this very, uh, the, by this very intensity of this bond between Paul and Miriam. Right. So you see that that is the case with uh, Miss Weston as well in this section, where Gertrude feels that she, if Gertrude, uh, feels a sense of jealousy and feels threatened with the relationship of Miss Weston and William. And William himself seems to be overly attached to his mother and continues to find uh, the characteristics of his mother through his uh, fiance and continue to end up disillusioned. Right. Okay. So from there, I want to go to the next page. Okay. Um. Uh, I, I will actually go to page number one hundred and sixty-one from here. So this is also the final section. Uh, that we will be looking at in this novel. So in mine, it's 161, but in your book, it is in page number 282. Okay, here, page number 282, final, uh, final line. Paul says, why don't you praise me up to the skies? She laughed. I should have the trouble of dragging you down again, she said. 
but she was full of joy nevertheless william had brought her with his sporting trophies she kept them still and she did not forgive his death arthur was handsome at least a good specimen and warm and generous and probably would do well in the end but paul paul was going to distinguish himself she had a great belief in him and more because he was unaware of his own powers there was so much to come of come out of him life for her was rich with promise she was to see herself fulfilled not for nothing had been her struggle so you can actually highlight that section because that is important because here it is very evident that gertrude attains fulfillment through the satisfaction born out of her own children's accomplishments right so this reflects the kind of relationship or bond that gertrude has with her own children to a certain extent we can say that her aspirations for outward mobility or social ascension and accomplishment through the lives of her own children is rather selfish and a uh, narcissistic development right because she comes across as a barrier in the development psychological development maturation and emancipation of her children because to become individuals of their own the children would have to break away from the mother's possessive hold right so therefore uh, you see that in order to break away from the mother's possessive hold uh, and continue on to pro progress in life, that would entail uh, a self-actualization. But in terms of uh, the mother's stifling relationship with them, it continues to curtail their process of self-actualization. And you see that in the case of the eldest son, William, William is unable to achieve his self-actualization. He's unable to break away completely from his mother as a result of his Oedipal fixation right and i've said one reason critics say for william's death is because he was not successful in completely breaking away from his edible fixation but paul on the other hand does so by the end of the narrative he achieves his self-actualization process like the classic bildung's roman protagonist that he is but as i've said instead uh, complete instead of completely critiquing Gertrude as a selfish narcissistic and possessive mother we had to attempt to understand her as well right because we had to understand her conditions her circumstances as well in terms of this dissatisfied and disillusioned and jaded marital life that she has led with morel her as a book and also her as we have to realize that she is also a woman who does not have the freedom, mobility, and agency which a man does within this patriarchal society back in Lawrence's youth. So, therefore, as a result, instead of completely perceiving her as this overtly possessive, overbearing, jealous sort of mother, we also have to try to understand her plight, that she is also a victim of the patriarchal society, that she has been dissatisfied in her marital life, right? Her, all her expectations have been shattered. So, in that sense, we have to understand the character of Gertrude Morrill as well. Okay. So it is at that point I'm going to end my lectures on D.H. Lawrence's Sons and Lovers. And in the next few lectures, I will upload some lectures on uh, Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. So I will end this session, the final lecture on Sons and Lovers. Thank you very much for your, uh, thank you very much for listening.